Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'd like to thank Sages and the moderators for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so my talk's a little bit different than Conrad's. I definitely can't match any of his videos, that's for sure. Um, and so these are my disclosures. None of the financial ones are really relevant. Um, so I will talk about my clinical disclosures a little bit. Um, so I did train at the Carolinas, and I was their fellow. Um, I'm also only in my second year of clinical practice, so to be exact, probably one year and five months. So my perspective is a little different, and obviously I'm just beginning my journey to robotic abdominal wall reconstruction. So this is gonna be a little bit uh, tailored differently. So I wanna be really transparent and kind of share with everyone sort of my timeline and practice. So I finished my surgery residency in 2019 and um, I will say I was fortunate to be at a program where I think I did a lot of laparoscopy. So when I graduated from residency, I actually went back and looked at my case logs to take a look at this. Um, so I had about 100 inguinal hernia repairs and 50% of them were TEPs and then 50% of them were open. And so when I went into fellowship, I felt very comfortable doing um, minimally invasive and laparoscopic inguinal hernias. And so during my fellowship, it was kind of a little different as well because we mostly did taps. So it was a little bit of a transition and a little bit of a different technique. Um, and, they, and, and so it, my exposure to robotics, um, you know, started in my residency and I'd graduated with my certificate and I was exposed to more of it during fellowship. But I'd say truly my robotic practice and fellowship was probably about five to 10% and most of them were inguinal or forget cases. So as I started my practice in 2020 during peak COVID, which is never a great time to start, um, and I was transitioning into practice, I really wanted to incorporate more robotics into my uh, general surgery practice. And so my practice makeup is, um, you know, mostly 20% general surgery, 30% foregut, and I'd say 50% hernia. And so I started, uh, you know, with two robotic days a month of block time and then other non-robotic days. And then by my first year of clinical practice, I was able to double that robotic time just by booking, I think, a lot of cases robotically. And now, um, as of February 2022, I have about five robotic days a month and, and then eight block days total. So uh, this is kind of a look at my case breakdown for my first year. So this is about 100 cases split up. And you can see that uh, robotic inguinals are actually a huge portion of my first initial cases. And I think if you're really starting your robotic practice, I think you have to really consider what your practice goals are going to be. So is it, you know, are you starting your practice like I am? Are you transitioning from being a primarily open surgeon to now robotics? Are you transitioning from primarily laparoscopic to robotic? And I think depending on what your goals are and what your practice is, you know, this is maybe be going to look very different for you. Um, so initially, one of my goals was filling my robotic block time. So as all of us know, that's kind of hard to come by, and you definitely don't want to lose it. Um, and so for me, I started booking all my inguinals robotically because I wanted to fill my block time. And so I think based off of that, it also helped me increase my efficiency by doing repetitive cases of something that I already knew how to do fairly well. Um, I also think that it was a really great way for me to get into resident teaching, um, as we do not have a very robust uh, robotic experience at Penn, and that's something that I'm trying to build. So I think it was also a really great way and a really good tool for me to um, incorporate the residents into more robotic surgery. And I think ultimately it's a gateway to complex robotic abdominal wall reconstruction. So I don't think that you know you can do anything that Conrad's doing without doing some of the basics. And I feel like inguinal hernias are a really, really great way to build your technical skills and being able to do the complex R tabs or the E tabs. Um, so I think, you know, it, it basically gives you all of the basics that you would need for any sort of robotic abdominal wall case, right? So you have to optimize your port placement. Um, you have to pay, position your patient correctly. If you don't have a paired bed like I do, you really have to think about positioning your patient before docking the robot. You also have to think about, like, how are you going to create your flap dissection? How are you going to do your hernia dissection? And what are your suturing skills robotically? I think all of these things are a little bit of a learning curve that's a little different than laparoscopy or even open. And I think when you're transitioning to a robotic practice, these are the things that are really practical, but that not everybody talks about. Um, so for me, um, you know, I started with really easy cases and transitioned to harder ones. So this is, you know, a very basic inguinal hernia that I did RTAP. And so I, I really liked these cases because I felt like it allowed me to build my robotic skills and build it off of something that I already knew how to do. So as you can tell, you create your flap, you do your um, space of retzius dissection. Here I'm creating more lateral flap and I'm starting to reduce the hernia. Um, and so I think it allows you to get very comfortable with the technical aspects of doing a robotic case on something that you may know how 
how to do well already. And so I also really particularly like the TAPS because I think it allows me to control more aspects of the case, especially in complex patients, um, and especially if they're on anticoagulation or have larger hernias. Um, I also love the visualization that these cases are able to afford me. So like I said, you know, I think it was really great to be able to practice in and to really get your technical skills down um, and to feel comfortable. And I don't think it's possible to do complex robotic cases without doing the easy ones first. I think all of us, you know, want to start on the complex redos because we're like, oh, this is a really difficult case. It would be great for the robot. But I think it's impossible to do these complex cases without having to do the easy ones first. Um, so this is a case of a redo, uh, redo that I did uh, for an incarcerated bladder and a left inguinal hernia. I didn't show the video because it was probably 30 minutes of me trying to reduce the bladder and then realizing that I needed to make a a hybrid open counter incision to get everything off of the old mesh. Um, but in any case, I think this case just shows you that it's really, really difficult to start on something like this as your first robotic case. And so really, I would encourage everyone, if you're thinking about using robotics in your practice, to start with the easy ones, get comfortable, and then um, transition to harder things. So things that I did wrong during my learning curve, um, so it's a lot. So I think, you know, patient positioning is something, you know, we often talk about, we don't talk about. But at the same time, I think it's also dependent on your institution. It's dependent on how your room is set up. Um, so this is the robotic room I most consistently have. And now for my inguinals, I usually just tuck one arm. And it's actually not the arm that the robot's coming in on, because I found that it was easier to tuck the arm um, where my right hand was going to be for the instrument exchanges or if my assistant needed to do anything. So for me, it was actually easier to tuck that one arm. I know some people tuck both, but for me, this works fairly well. Um, so initially when I started um, and in my residency, we actually did a lot of SIs. So I felt like when I transitioned to the XI, I was placing my ports too low. So I was kind of struggling with my flap because I felt like my camera was too close to my flap. And then I ultimately moved my port sites higher. Um, you know, of course, you have docking inefficiencies um, at the beginning. And I think, you know, as somebody who's just starting out, you don't realize how much your attending helps you until you get there and you're the attending. And uh, so thank you to all the attendings out there <laughs> who are patient enough to put up with all of this. Um, but it's really great to see, you know, like, oh, this is, and also how to verbalize the docking experience, right? So now that I'm teaching my junior residents, you know, to be able to verbalize, like, okay, these are the steps that you need to do. This is what you need to do with your hands and positioning, and this is, you know, what's going to help you. Um, so initially, you know, when you're making the flap, sometimes you make it too small, sometimes you make it too large, and that also makes your case more or less difficult. Uh, sometimes when you're suturing for the first time using the V-lock or you're teaching somebody to how to suture, there can be a lot of efficiencies. Uh, I tend to like to use the uh, suture mega cut. So, um, you know, when I'm teaching my residents, I always have to be really careful to tell them, remember there's scissors at the back of this so don't cut the stitch. Um, but some, sometimes it happens and then you move on. But I think these are all the little things that, um, that you really have to kind of figure out during your learning curve. Uh, so I did look at some studies to look at, you know, what is the true learning curve of looking at robotic-assisted, you know, RTAPs for inguinal hernias, and I think the answer is kind of different. So this is kind of an interesting study that just got published in Surgical Endoscopy in, uh, just this year. And so in this particular case, the surgeon, um, who's an experienced laparoscopist, I think he said he had done over 150 inguinal hernias, looked at his sort of cumulative sum of, you know, what it, how many cases it took for him to decrease his um, time on uh, the robot for inguinal hernias. And I think his case number was 138. So, I mean, that's actually pretty high if you think about it. I think what's also really interesting about this paper is that he kind of looks at if there's any complication differences early in his learning curve versus late, and there doesn't seem to be any. Um, he talks about how patient outcomes are very similar, and that after 138 cases, um, the average decrease of cases per minute was about six. So this is a different study uh, looking at something very similar. And in this particular paper, there's three surgeons uh, looking at 172 consecutive cases. And these are also experienced laparoscopic surgeons. And it took them 43 cases to decrease operative time. So I think the true answer is, you know, there's probably no true set number for any one person doing uh, robotic inguinal 
coronal hernia operations, I think it's gonna be very different depending on the individual and your comfort level. And this is probably very different if you're a primary open surgeon transitioning to robotics. I think the anatomy um, for this particular case can be very complex and different. Um, and that learning curve is probably extended. So I think there's a lot of strategies to sort of get over the learning curve and improve. Um, I think I've definitely done a combination of all of these. Uh, so obviously ask for help, um, you know, take an intuitive course. I've taken several and, and they've been really helpful in terms of getting on the robot and being able to practice some of these skills. Um, if this is a case you're doing for the first time, have a proctor available. Uh, practice and do a dry run. Um, you'd be surprised at how well it is when you just talk through the case uh, beforehand, even with your scrub team, um, especially if it's a complex case that you've never done before. Um, and it's really great to get everyone on the same page. So on the day of surgery, nobody's surprised and everyone feels like they're on the same page. You can also do case observations. There's a million great videos on Facebook um, and online as well. And I think something else that we don't often talk about is record and review your own cases. Um, sometimes I like to look at my own cases and then I'll be like, oh yeah, that, that was a mistake right there. Or that's something that maybe I could have done better. This is something I could have improved in efficiency. And I think it's also helpful when you review cases with your residents as well. Um, and when you take a look at them and you show them, well, actually here's something, and I tell them all the time, like actually here's something that I think I could have improved on to let them know that it's okay to just, you know, say that you can improve and that, you know, what you're doing now shouldn't be what you're doing five years from now or even 10 years from now. Um, so, speaking of residents, I really like the robot because I can use it to advance resident education. Um, so primarily, um, I get mostly second and third years who rotate with me, and many of them at that point have not done a lot of laparoscopic inguinal hernia surgery. So for them, it's really, I think um, the basics are learning the anatomy and learning how to do the dissection safely. But at the same time, if they haven't been on the robot very much at all, I think it's a really, really great opportunity to teach them the basic skills of how to clutch how to use the camera, and how to do the suturing. And so here you can see, um, this is my resident and I doing an inguinal hernia together. And uh, for the second half of the case, I'm teaching them how to suture, how to secure the mesh, how to tie knots lap, uh, robotically that they can then transition to laparoscopic or other robotic cases. And I'm also teaching them how to suture the flap, how to handle the V-lock. And I think it allows them to practice in real time a lot of the technical skills. And then once they master that, I let them move on to the flap dissection, I let them, and and then lastly, the inguinal hernia dissection and mesh placement. So I think there's a lot of different parts of the case that you can actually give away to your residents. And, um, and in different cases, for instance, forget cases, I let them have the fourth arm and be my assistant, or I teach them how to suture on the fund application. So I think there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of ways to learn yourself and also educate others as you're going through this process. Um, and so lastly, I think really uh, robotics is a team sport. So much more than any other type of surgery, um, it, it's something where you have to have efficiency as a team. And so, you know, it's your scrub, it's your circulator in the room. You have to have people who are, um, who have the knowledge of robotics and how to drive the robot, for instance, or how to help you dock. Um, so I don't routinely have my resident stay scrubbed in at bedside. We have a dual console, so usually the resident with, is with me on the console. And I think it's important to have a very consistent team so they know how you like to put sutures in or how, how to troubleshoot if something happens at bedside in terms of burping a trocar or cleaning. And I think some of those things just help increase your efficiency. And without them, I think it can be very, very difficult. And I also think developing a routine is really important. So I actually started booking all my inguinal hernias on one day. So we're doing, you know, like three or four in a day. Um, and then I'll do all my R taps on one day. So we're doing some of the same cases over and over and over with the same team. And I think that repetition really, really helps and builds your team camaraderie. And so I think ultimately in short, um, there's a lot that I'm still learning and I'm sure we'll continue to learn. And so I think, you know, now um, moving on to more complex robotic abdominal wall repairs, um, I'm working on my patient selection still improving efficiency as well as my um, efficiency and improvement and resident education. And I think it changes all the time. So really I feel like I'm just at the start of my robotic abdominal wall <laughs> reconstruction journey. Um, but so far I've really enjoyed um, the the, the cases and the patient outcomes that it's allowed me to have, as well as um, my role in resident education. So I definitely think it's something I'm gonna continue. Thank you so much for your attention.